welcome to our 12th lesson this quarter. I'll be reading today from the book of Ezra, uh, verses 1 through 6, and then 10 through 13. When the seventh month came, and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, son of Josedek, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shelatiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of God of Israel, of, of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundation because they were in dread of the neighboring peoples. And they offered burnt offerings upon it to the Lord morning and evening. And they kept the festival of booths as prescribed and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the ordinance as required for each day. And after that, the regular burnt offerings the offerings at the new moon, and at all the sacred festivals of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. And then beginning with verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families Old people who had seen the house on its foundations wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. In July of 2019, a fire completely destroyed the Memorial Drive Church of God in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the following Sunday, the congregation met in the parking lot uh, for worship. They could not be in their building. It was just a charred a mess, but they met in the parking lot nonetheless. And uh, one man, a longtime member, Doug Townsend, said, At the time that I felt some sadness, there is also some joy there, because I know there are going to be some great things coming. Sadness and joy in the face of that ruined church. Then in 2012, a man logged into a uh, legal website that offers uh, legal advice and asked if he could sue his former church for all the tithes and offerings that he had given it over the years because he'd chosen to leave the church because the church wasn't meeting his expectations. And basically he was saying, I don't think I got what I paid for. Can I ask for a refund? And the uh, lawyers responded back that no, he probably would lose that suit because he gave those offerings as a free will offering and he wasn't really buying anything with those offerings and so he couldn't now ask for them back because the church had somehow uh, defrauded him or, or, or not lived up to, to their end of the deal. Now both of these are fairly common stories. I just picked two of them. I could have found many, many others. Uh, where people, uh, uh, churches get destroyed and the church has to choose how to react and people get disgruntled with church and they have to choose how to react. And that, in a sense, is also what is going on in this morning's uh, scripture passage. Now let's uh, look at a little bit of the context uh, for what's going on here. In 586, or maybe a year earlier in 587, in the month of July, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. That was the temple that Solomon built that we uh, talked about in our last lesson. And a few thousand of the Judahites, and they were Judahites because by that time Israel had already been completely destroyed. Assyria destroyed them in 721, and the northern kingdom of Israel uh, ceased to exist uh, from that time un until this. Uh, but the, the Judahites were taken, or some of them, a few thousand of them, were taken as captives to Babylon. And in 539, nearly 50 years later, Cyrus the Persian conquers Babylon, and Cyrus allows the captives to begin going back. And it wasn't this great flood of everyone going back, but it was a little more of a trickle. A few went back, and then a few more went back, 
Uh, and uh, eventually, um, um, some, I, I suppose, never went back. But it wasn't just that everybody went back in a flood, but they went back. But the first group that came back, uh, the, the story of Ezra begins with them. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the book is called Ezra, but Ezra himself uh, doesn't appear in the book until chapter 7 out of uh, 10 chapters. And he doesn't actually come back to Jerusalem in that chapter 7 until... Um, the year, uh, almost 80 years after uh, the initial time when the captives were allowed to return. And so although it's called Ezra, most of the book uh, doesn't deal with, with him uh, directly. And today's scripture, as I mentioned, relates directly to those first captives who came home, or the first ones who, who came back. And when they got there, they discovered that the brothers and sisters that essentially they had left behind, who had not had to go into exile, were still there. Uh, but the temple was still just a ruined wreck, and apparently most, if not all, worship of God had ceased at the temple site, maybe ceased completely. Uh, you wonder maybe the exiles had longed so much when they were out and away from home to be back in Jerusalem, to be able to worship back at the temple, that that's why they are the ones that spurred the whole country then to decide to, to rebuild the temple. But, but even before they rebuild, rebuilt the temple, to restart worship, uh, they are on that very special sacred site. Uh, they do that, of course. They not only begin the rebuilding, as you heard, but, but before that, they uh, re uh, start back worship. And it's the daily worship and the monthly festivals and the annual festivals, and all of that was accompanied with uh, animal sacrifice, uh, just as it had been done all of those many years before. And what they really were trying to do was to bring back uh, the, the focus of all of the people, not only those who came back, but those who had been there, bring their focus back to God and, and reestablish uh, their country as one that was a country that was focused completely on God. Well, these were, of course, hopeful times, but they also were uncertain times. Ezra 3, 3 says part of the reason they did this was because they lived in dread of the neighboring peoples, and that was they were wise to do so. There were enemies all around them. Uh, in the very next chapter, the enemies are going to, to cook up some reasons to, to convince the Persian government to, to tell the uh, Judahites that they have to stop rebuilding the temple, uh, and it took some time before they were allowed to restart again, and so there was a reason for all of that, and yet they were home again. It wasn't the home they had left all those years before in many ways, but yet they were home. And so it was both a hopeful and an uncertain time. And our story ends today with those uh, temple foundations being uh, uh, restored. Uh, they worshiped there at the site of the ruined temple, probably, uh, you know, still the charred remains there from where it had been burned, uh, the debris there from the damage all of there for at least a couple of years uh, before, the, that, before they rebuilt it. And um, we see uh, then in that second little bit that we read, concrete, not literally concrete, the Romans would invent that, but, but, but uh, literally uh, 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 tangible ways that their uh, life is coming back as they rebuild those temple walls. And actually they just begin today with the foundation of the temple. And a great celebration with great joy was made, uh, but the elders, the old people who remembered the old temple in all of its glory, uh, they wept. And one of those biblically uh, poetic phrases, I just love this phrase, the author says, the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. And we will return to that in a little while, but let's dig a little bit deeper. When they came home, they did not bring with them copies of the scripture. And the scriptures were not written down until they were taken into exile in Babylon. But when they come back, they don't bring those scrolls with them. But they do have enough of the oral history and enough, perhaps, even you know, of the lived experience to know this is the way we are to worship. Uh, these, This is the daily worship and the monthly, weekly and monthly and annual festivals that we are to observe. Uh, they knew the law of Moses. They understood that Moses was the man of God, and they tried to follow uh, the traditions and the worship patterns that, that Moses had left for them. Now, in the fourth quarter, uh, a lesson of this quarter, we learned how God, in the first chapter of Leviticus, uh, told how the offerings were to be made, and, and part of that was that many of the offerings were to be uh, completely consumed on the altar. Uh, the Hebrew there is korban, uh, K-O-R-B-A-N, or Q-U-N. 
A-R-B-O-N. Uh, when it was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, it was translated Holocaust, which is interesting. So the Holocaust, when we hear that word, we think, of course, of Nazi Germany and them trying to completely extinguish the Jewish people. But in the biblical context, the Holocaust is the animal is completely extinguished. Uh, now that uh, varies or contrasts from the way other festivals work or other sacrifices work. At the Passover festival, for example, a lamb was brought to be sacrificed and part of the lamb was given back to the person who brought the sacrifice and they would take it back home or back where they were staying and prepare it for the fat Passover feast for that evening. But many of these sacrifices that we read about here in Ezra are uh, a korban. They are the animal is completely sacrificed. And the implication there is that it is given as a completely free will offering to God. There is no expectation of anything in return. It's given either as a thanksgiving to God for what God has already done or a way of seeking atonement from sin. But even when it is seeking atonement from sin, it isn't buying the atonement, but it actually is thanking God for being a God of mercy who forgives sin when we confess our sin and ask for forgiveness. And so it isn't a buying of uh, atonement, but it is a, a, a thanksgiving for the atonement that God gives. My wife and I have some friends, and every year at Christmas, they wrap up a couple of kind of generic Christmas gifts. They don't put anybody's name or anything on it, and they just kind of go under the tree or in a closet or whatever. And if somebody comes to their house and brings them a Christmas gift, they will say, oh, we have one for you as well. And they bring out the gift, and they give them this gift as if they had planned it all along. And they, they call it their retaliatory Christmas gifts. So they can give it uh, to retaliate against somebody almost when they give them a gift. And the idea is, well, maybe somebody's going to give me a gift in expectation that I'm supposed to re reply and give them a gift as well. And yet, that's not what a gift is at all, is it? If I give you a gift in expectation that you're going to give me something back, I'm not giving you a gift. I'm just kind of buying something um, from you. And that gift isn't really given in love or thanksgiving. It's given in expectation of getting something back. Uh, likewise, if I have a retaliatory gift and I give it to you because you gave me a gift, I'm not really giving it to you in love. I'm really giving it uh, to try to save face. That's right. I say, oh, yes, of course, I thought about you. You're just such one of my, my favorite people. I, I, I was thinking of you when I purchased this gift uh, just for you. And all of that, of course, is a lie and there's no love in it. Well, that's not what the Korban was. That was not the way that the sacrifices were supposed to be. Likewise, with the man who wanted to sue his church because they failed to meet his expectations, he was apparently giving to the church and really, by implication, giving to God in a way to create some dependency. Well, now you have to do what I want you to do because I've paid you for these services or for this expectation that, that I want you to do. And uh, if you're not doing that, then I want my money back. And so he wasn't really giving out of love, uh, but rather out of a hope of enforcing the church or perhaps God uh, to act in the ways that he wanted them to act. And that is, of course, the opposite of the sacrifices that the people at the temple bring. Or at least we hope that it was the opposite. They came offering thanksgivings to God for sustaining them in captivity or for bringing them home. They brought them in love for a merciful God who forgives. They brought them in trust that a God that God would preserve them from the, the neighbors that they dreaded. And, and they brought those sacrifices. And remember, it was the very best they could. They had to be sacrifices without blemish uh, so that they could be completely consumed with no benefit to them. It was a gift they were giving to God. Well, let's think a little bit about the witness of the church and how it connects with this. Uh, and I want to particularly do this with this uh, interesting uh, final piece of the passage where Ezra tells us that the elders were weeping. Um, and some assume that they were weeping because they see the outline of the old temple now. The debris has been cleared off and the foundation is now there. Uh, and, and they weep for what they have lost. They miss that old temple so much. And so they're consumed with nostalgia. And they just can't believe that the new temple will ever be as grand as it once was. Other people think that maybe they're weeping with joy. Because here was a dream they never thought they would see come to fruition. And there it was. All of those years, nearly 50 years in captivity. Two more years back in Jerusalem. Um, uh, worshiping each and every day and, and each and every week and each and every month and, uh, and through these annual festivals, 
on this temple site and seeing the debris of the temple and the burned out hulk and shell of the temple and they thought they would never see it cleared off, never see it restored and here it was restored. So maybe it was out of complete joy that they wept, tears of joy. I wonder, however, if the true uh, story isn't somewhere in between nostalgia and, and, and all they had lost and joy at what they were they were looking for in the future, what they thought was going to happen in in um, in the in the future. Um, the foundation that they are weeping for all that they have lost, and they're honest about that. They have not only lost the temple, but these old people have lost many, many loved ones in the war, in the siege of Jerusalem. Babylonians were brutal. Uh, they had been ripped away from their families, and some of their families had remained in in Israel, were allowed to remain. Others were taken off. Uh, to Babylon, and, and many died in Babylon and back in Jerusalem. Their lives were completely different, and even though Cyrus had let them come back home, they still were under his rather benevolent but still authoritative thumb, and they could only do what he did and they or, or ordered or allowed, and so they still uh, longed for freedom. There was much to weep over. They were living in very uncertain times, and yet they also had to be full of so much hope, seeing the temple beginning to be rebuilt, being able to worship again there at the temple, seeing God at work in their lives in so many ways. And I really think that the man in Tulsa, Oklahoma, standing there after his church uh, was uh, destroyed, but able to worship, uh, nevertheless, really got it right when he says, at the time that I felt some sadness, there's also some joy there because I know there are going to be some great things coming. And whether or not that was the attitude of those people in Judah, that really ought to be our attitude. We should be honest about our sadness and about the things that cause us grief and pain and cause us to weep. But we should always, as Paul said, grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Look for the hope. Where is the hope? And recognize that God still has many great things prepared for us. In many ways, I see this like the instructions that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians on how we are to do the Lord's Supper. He sets the scene by telling us, on the night he was betrayed, this the scene takes place at a terrible time. Jesus is going to be betrayed and he's going to die. There is reason to weep on that evening. And yet on that very evening, they were celebrating that wonderful story, the Exodus story, the Passover story, when God saves his people from slavery and brings them to the promised land. During the meal, Jesus takes wonderful things, bread and wine, and yet he says, this bread broken is like my broken body, and this wine poured out is like my blood that is going to be poured out. Reason to weep there, and yet his sacrifice is what ultimately is what defeated death, and his resurrection is what promises us that we will never have to truly taste death, but that we will have eternal life with him. And so Paul ends his instructions by telling us that every time we eat the bread remembering Christ's broken body and drink the wine remembering his blood shed because we are sinners, we so proclaim his death, which also is not a good thing, until he comes. We proclaim that uh, the terrible sacrifice that he had to make because of our sin as we look to the hope of eternal life with him when he returns. And so we can say, at the time I feel some sadness, but there's also some joy because I know there are going to be some great things coming. Well, what does this mean for us in the here and the now? Well, in one way, we live in a very different culture than those of than those Judahites had when they returned home after so many years. Uh, yet when they returned home, they found that um, Many of those who had stayed behind had abandoned the temple and apparently abandoned worship as well. And I can imagine that they were feeling like that um, uh, that those who were not taken into captivity uh, were felt like maybe the temple and maybe even God as well hadn't done anything for them. So that's why they just abandoned the temple and maybe even abandoned God. Uh, they were like the man that wanted to sue the church. Look, we didn't want our uh, country be overrun. We didn't want all these things to happen to us. You didn't save us from these things. And so uh, we kind of want our money back, or at the very best, we're not going to offer uh, any more. Um, and ours is kind of a society like that. And that can get into us too. We're in a consumerist society where everything is about, I'm going to do something for you, expecting something in return. And, and everything is about a, a, a transactional kind of business. I, I'll, I'll support you as long as you do something for me. And you'll support me as long as I'm doing something to, to support you, uh, this kind of thing. And that creeps into our church. 
We sometimes hear people say, well, I'm looking for a church that will meet my needs. Or hear somebody say, well, I left that church because I wasn't being fed. Now, on the one hand, we ought to have our needs met in church, and we also ought to be fed in church, and yet that is a very consumerist way of looking at church because what do those exiles who come back say? Well, we want to set the altar up again so that we can give things to God that will be completely consumed, not so that we can get things from God, that we're purchasing things from God, but we're offering thanksgiving to God, both for what God has done and for what we know that God will do, but we're not buying them. Uh, and, and they want all of this to be redone so that, restored so that uh, the focus will return to God. And so the church ultimately isn't about meeting my needs or meeting your needs or even feeding me or feeding you. The church is about helping us give all of we of what we are and who we are and all that we have over to God. Not so that we can buy uh, what God, uh, things uh, from God for God to do things for us, but out of thanksgiving, God, you are the one who gave me life. You are the one who has saved me time and time again. You are the one, even at my death, who will usher me into eternal life. And so I want to give everything I have to you as a holocaust, as something to be completely consumed just for you, not out of benefit for me. And anytime we move off of that as our focus, then we actually are moving into idolatry. And often that idol that we're worshiping is ourselves. And, and um, uh, this passage and, and the scriptures call us uh, not to do that. I also think we can learn a lot from those elders in Jerusalem who wept. Uh, one of my mentors was the Reverend Dr. John Claypool, and he was famous for saying, nostalgia is that sneaking suspicion that God peaked out at some point in the past. Now think about that. When I'm really being nostalgic, and there's, some, there's something wonderful about nostalgia. We want to look back on the past, and I want to really think about the good more than the bad. And my past has both in it, as yours does. But I want to remember those wonderful times in the past. But if all I can do is look back with nostalgia, and I'm just overwhelmed with nostalgia, and so I look around at the present and I weep because the present isn't that imagined past. And the past was never as good as we imagined that it was. But if I look back into that imagined past, and I think the present will never be that good again. What is that? Well, that is the sneaking suspicion that God peaked out at some point in my past or some point in the past uh, life of the church or the past life of the Bible. And yet that is not the story of the Bible, is it? The story of the Bible is that God ultimately is going to redeem all of creation and God's already done that in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. That's when, as C.S. Lewis says, death starts working backwards. That's when we can find our hope. Years ago, I was on the board uh, of another denomination, and at one of our board meetings, they showed us a commercial that they had uh, commissioned to be made that was going to be shown on TV as a, as a gospel presentation. And I, it was so powerful, I've never forgotten it. It began with a young man walking down the street, his head down, and tears are just streaming out of his face, out of his eyes. And it doesn't say why he was so upset, but he's just so obviously full of grief and sorrow and pain. And he's walking down the street just completely hopeless. And he comes to a church, and there are the steps of the church going up. And he looks up the steps, and you can see he's kind of considering. And then he climbs the steps and walks into the sanctuary of the church. It wasn't a Sunday morning, it was an empty sanctuary, but he goes and he sits down in a pew and he kind of is walking in in shadow. But as he sits down, the sun from the window lights up his face and he sits there again for a moment or two and the tears are still coming down and his face is still downturned. And then he lifts his face up kind of into the light and the faintest little bit of a smile comes to his face even as the tears continue down. And then there was some... A voiceover about the hope of Christ. Uh, and it was such a powerful passage because in the midst of his pain, before his situation had been fixed, whatever it was that was going on, he found hope. And so in his pain, in his tears, he also finds hope. Uh, it reminds me of Paul telling us that we are to grieve but not as those who have no hope. That's what he discovers there in the church. And indeed, that is the call of the church, to help all of us in whatever situation we find ourselves. We may be like those people who see that foundation of the, of the temple laid, and they are shouting with joy about everything that God has done and is doing in their lives. And church needs to be a place where we can shout with joy, 
for all those things that God has done for us. But the others are weeping, and maybe they're weeping for what they have lost, but we hope that they also are weeping and finding hope even in the midst of their weeping because they know that God will eventually rebuild that temple, and even more powerfully, whether they recognize it or not, God will bring the temple, God's presence to earth, literally, in the person of Jesus Christ, who will be physically on earth for them, who will be there to die for them and for us, and be raised again for all of our benefit forever and ever. Amen.